Yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, so today I'll talk about sequential decision making with limited resources. Uh, before I start telling you what it is about, let me motivate by why you would want to care about such problems. I'll start with a real life story. So this last Sunday, if you're a sports fan, you would know you had some tough choices to make. Either you wanted to watch the men's finals of the Wimbledon or the IC Cricket World Cup finals. And being a grad student, I just had one streaming, uh, streaming service. So every few seconds, I need to make the decision. Am I watching the right sport or can I switch to get more action? And you need to keep doing this again and again. And I don't know a priori which of the two games is going to be good. I mean, bad luck on Sunday, both games were too good. So I had to make a choice. But I mean, these kind of uh, situations occur in uh, daily life every time. So for instance, let's say you come to the airport hey, at Baltimore. Hey, yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you put your, uh, can you put your Skype on you? Because I'm getting the audio feed between two different sources. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. Let me do that. Right. It should be fine now, right? Good, yeah, okay. So uh, let's say you come to the Baltimore airport and you are looking for an Uber ride. So you, uh, you take up your Uber app and you search for drivers. Uber is trying to make a real-time decision. So at this point, it has a set of uh, drivers, it has a limited pool of drivers. And it needs to match you to one of the drivers. And it, of course, it has to make other decisions like what price to set and so on. And uh, the goal for Uber's point of view is to maximize its revenue. And, but it's limited by the amount of driver it has. And it doesn't know a priori like what all the requests you're going to get. Or consider another example. Let's say you're trying to book airline prices. So let's say I'm trying to book an airline ticket from here back to my home in Bangalore. So I go and search on an airline site and I see uh, what the prices are. So it, it quotes me some price, in this case, upwards of $2,000. And I see, OK, that's too much for me to buy, so I don't buy at this point. And then uh, I, I go at another point, and I see what prices the airline uh, quotes. Now it quotes another price, say, let's say around $1,000. So at this point, this seems reasonable to me, so I will buy it. So airline, again, is having a limited inventory of seats. And it's trying to uh, find the right price so that it can maximize its profit. So such examples come again and again in multiple uh, multiple domains. So for instance, ads or online dating, crowdsourcing, and so on. And these are kind of quite important uh, applications in the sense that they make a lot of money. So for instance, ad is supposed to uh, approximately uh, generate 6% of US GDP, which is like $1 trillion. So I guess now you're kind of convinced that if you study these problems, you'll become rich. So let's see how do we study such problems. So formally, uh, sequential decision making is the following setup. So you have t rounds of interaction between an algorithm and a nature. And this t is known a priori to everyone. So in each round t, you observe some part of the input. So for instance, it's a ride request in this case. Uh, so you observe a part of the input. And once you see the input, the algorithm chooses an action at from the set of available actions. So in this, in this scenario, say Uber has to choose a driver to match the rider. And then uh, once you choose the action, uh, you receive a reward uh, RT, which depends on AT. So abstractly, it's, it, your action gives you some kind of reward. So it could be the price of the trip or any other reward function you choose. And critically, what happens is after you choose an action AT, your set of actions get updated. So it goes from AT to AT plus 1. So your input could depend on your action. Your uh, reward depends on the action. The way AT to AT plus 1 goes also depends on your action. So everything depends on your action. And the goal is to maximize the total reward you get after t time steps. So the algorithm has to maximize its total reward. And what is limited resources about uh, limited resource here? The fact that at plus one can start to become smaller and smaller. So you cannot play the same action for multiple times, for instance. Okay. So this talk is going to be about algorithms for uh, sequential decision making with limited resources. In particular, it's going to be two, two different models. One is called online matching. I'll formally define what online matching is. And the second part is going to be called bandits with knapsacks. And again, I will define what exactly uh, it's formally. So any questions at this point? Like, Are you uh, at least satisfied that uh, these are important things to study? OK. So let me start with online matching. Uh, so what is online matching? So you have so you're given a graph. So the algorithm is given a graph, which is known a priori. Uh, and one side of the vertices is known a priori. So let's call it U and or offline vertices. So it's known a priori. Here, the red, uh, the red vertices are the one which are known a priori. And uh, you have these green vertices that come online. So they come online. So you get one vertex at a time. When a vertex comes, the algorithm needs to match 
uh, a vertex to one of its neighbors. So if you, if you don't remember what graph matching is, you want to select a subset of edges such that they have no common endpoints. So when one green vertex comes, you either have to choose to match it to one of the available vertices, or you can choose to drop it. And uh, the goal is after these T steps happen, your algorithm would have collected some matching, and you want to maximize the weight of that matching. So each of these edges have some, some weights, and you want to maximize the total weight of the matching. So the critical assumption we make is that these uh, vertices, they are coming from a known distribution. So this, the distribution from which these, so these things are sampled from some distribution, and that distribution is known to the algorithm a priori. Uh, and additionally, we'll make one other assumption that uh, this distribution also has the following property, that the expected number of times any vertex comes is going to be an integer. And without loss of generality, we'll assume that integer is 1. So otherwise, you can just split it into multiple vertices and each with expected arrival of one. So, so can you tell us what the bottleneck case is? Why do you need the I mean, so if, if it's like 7.3, it's probably not a big deal. So what's the bottleneck? So, so the bottleneck case is like when these arrivals are like, say, 1 over n kind of thing. Like they're, so they depend on the total number of time steps. So if it's a constant, you're fine. Like if it's a constant, rationally, you're fine. If it starts to depend on, say, 1 over n or something like that, then that's kind of the bad case. So for this talk, we'll just assume they're integer and they're one. Uh, so now I'm sure you're thinking uh, if it's known, it's it's one, it's kind of like pretty simple. So uh, why is it hard? I will motivate why it's hard in just a bit. So let's see how it uh, fits the online uh, or the sequential decision making framework, right? So what is the input xt you observe at every time? You observe the vertex arrival v at time t. So the vertex which comes at time t is what you're seeing. And the action you have to choose is one of the available neighbors in the offline set. So that is the action you have to choose at every time step. The reward you get is the weight of the matching you chose, or weight of the edge you chose at that time step. And the set of the set 80 plus 1 is now, uh, if you match it to some vertex u in the offline setting, in the offline uh, vertex set, you cannot match it anymore. So uh, your 80 plus 1 has one less vertex you can match. And how do we make yeah. What does set v remain say for? Yeah, so you will sample one vertex from it uh, at every time step, but the set is the same. So how do you measure uh, like how good your algorithm is doing? So we'll use a standard notion called competitive ratio. So competitive ratio is measured as follows. So uh, let's say alg is some random variable which denotes the total weight of the matching. And let's say op is the total optimum maximum weight of matching you can get if you knew everything a priori. Like if, you, if I knew the exact uh, realization of the sequence, Let's say opt is that, that random variable, and what is the maximum weight matching on that? And then the competitive ratio is just the expected value of the algorithm to the expected value of the optimal. So this is a number that is going to be between 0 and 1. Of course, 1 means you're doing really well. 0 means you're doing bad. And you want to get as high as higher competitive ratios. So does anything more when you want the expectation of alg over opt? Yeah. So, uh, so not much, actually. So like only like unweighted settings, some things are not. But it's, it's, it's a slightly more harder metric than this. So this is the easier metric. OK, so yeah, and the expectation, as usual, involves all randomness. So expectation of the algorithm is all randomness the algorithm can use, plus the randomness of the arrivals. And the optimal uh, expectation is over the expectation of the randomness of the arrivals. Okay, so is what competitive ratio is that uh, clear? And uh, yeah. two distributions can be slightly off that case, right? In other words, two expectations are being taken. Right. So the two distributions can be different in this definition. Yeah, I mean, so the algorithms, the, the random variable of the algorithm can be different. But the question that I would ask, you have to use the same distribution. No, so there the expectation would be over all randomness. So all randomness. Yeah, so it's like, I think whatever he's asking is slightly harder. So I think he's asking, yeah, sure, uh, like, I'll give you a realization. Yeah of both the random coins of the algorithm and the arrival sequence, now you have to kind of uh, so maximize that ratio. Yeah, exactly. Even here, actually, technically, the denominator is the randomness over the arrival sequence and any potential randomness. Yeah, if the optimal uses some randomness. OK, so we won't really deal with expected value of op. So we'll always kind of deal with a linear program that's uh, upper bound on this. So this is going to be this is like a fairly standard technique. And you'll see this again and again in this talk. Uh, so 
let's see what here's a linear program which will which i claim is an upper bound on the expected value of op so let's say you have a random uh, a variable xe which denotes the probability that you will match uh, edge e in the optimal solution so this is stating that uh, the first constraint is saying that you, can, you cannot match any vertex uh, u more than once in expectation. And the right-hand side is saying that uh, you cannot match any v more than expected number of times it arrives. Right? And uh, x lies between 0 and 1, and you want to maximize the total weight of the matching, which is sum over all edges, weight times x e. So if you just use this interpretation that uh, x e is the probability at which you will uh, match edge e in the optimal solution, Kind of an easy argument will show that uh, this LP value is an upper bound on the expected value of op. And critically, this LP can be written down even before the game starts. Because the distribution is known, the only thing I need is the expected number of arrivals of each vertices, each vertex. So I might as well just write this LP down even before it starts. Is there a language so it's independent and identical, for instance. Yeah. So. Uh, Right, so I can write down this LP before it starts, and uh, I can kind of use the optimal solution to this LP in some way I want. So in particular, it seems like, OK, one natural approach is if I can write down this LP, why don't I just write it and sample from it, right? So the natural attempt would be just write down this linear program, and then when I uh, choose an edge E with probability x E, right, in each round. So let's take the simple scenario where like the weights are all one. So it's an unweighted graph, so to speak. And I want to analyze what this will give me. Like, I mean, if this solves the problem for me, like why bother solving it? So uh, what is the probability that a vertex V would never arrive in T round? So the probability that a vertex V arrives in one round is something like one over T. So because of this kind of uh, without loss of generality assumption of making expected arrivals to be exactly one, uh, it's not hard to see that uh, the, the probability of which any word, single vertex will be sampled is 1 over t. Uh, so the probability that a vertex v never arrives in one round is 1 minus 1 over t. And since we are using independence, so you will have a uh, probability that a v never arrives in any of the t rounds is 1 minus 1 over t to the t, or it's approximately 1 over e. Like e is the Euler's constant. So what does this mean? This means that uh, an edge e, you can only hope to match an edge e with probability at most 1 minus 1 over e times x e. Right, because when a vertex uh, comes, you are going to match its neighbor with probability x e, and uh, the probability that it's ever going to come is one minus one over e. So, if you use some linearity of expectation, uh, you can see that the competitive ratio is going to be at most one minus one over e. So, it's too bad. I mean, uh, we get some competitive ratio, but it's not like the right or it's not the optimal one. So, the problem is like I mean, not trivial. So, here's a picture. So. Competitive ratio between 0 and 1, and you get a competitive ratio of 1 minus 1 over e with this simple algorithm, so to speak. And in fact, like uh, this analysis is tight, meaning that this algorithm actually gets you 1 minus 1 over e. Like whatever I showed you just gives you an upper bound, but it gets you exactly equal to 1 minus 1 over e up to lower order terms. And uh, the thing is, uh, if the vertices are coming adversarially, meaning that there is no distribution known to the algorithm, and if I'm going to send these vertices, uh, said like uh, by an adversary beforehand to like make your algorithm perform as bad as possible. Even then, you can get one minus one over e, and in fact, it's optimal. This is the celebrated result of Karp Vazirani and Vazirani. So we are really not improving even after considering a slightly simpler problem. So which is why this natural attempt doesn't work. And the key issue here is that uh, the if you notice, there was a constant probability of deviation from the mean. So the mean was one, but with some constant probability, some vertex never arrived. And our algorithm is going to kind of work with this issue and kind of try to fix it. So are there questions at this point? OK, so let's see what is known. So let's look at unweighted graphs. A lot is known. So in fact, the Feldman et al paper, which I told, gives another algorithm that gives 0.67, which is slightly larger than 1 minus 1 over e. And uh, then there's a bunch of follow-up work until Jelly and Lou, who give a uh, competitive ratio of 0.729. Or more critically, it's of the form 1 minus 2 over e square, where e is, again, the Euler constant. And on the lower bound side, meaning like what is the best possible thing any algorithm can do unconditionally, that is known to be 0.823. So there is still some gap between the upper and the lower bound. And uh, our first result is that to show that you can act. So this 1 minus 2 over e squared was kind of believed to be the right number 
the sense that that is uh, that is like a nice expression. So people thought that is optimal. So first thing we show that that is not optimal. So you can get something slightly larger than that in the unweighted setting. And uh, so in a weighted graph, so which is what we started to study, which is that edges have weights. Like, I mean, not much action here. So there's one paper which kind of beats 1 minus 1 over E and gets 0. 0.67, again, slightly more than 1 minus 1 over E. And weighted graphs are like a harder problem. So the lower bounds on unweighted graphs follow. So the upper bound is 0. 0.823. And now there's a, still a larger gap between uh, the lower bound and the upper bound. And so we improved this, uh, this result from 0. 0.67 to 0. 0.705. So I mean, this is, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, we we improve this 0.67 to 0 0.705. So our upper bound on the competitive ratio is going to be 0 0.705. Okay, so are there questions? So, okay, so in the next few minutes, I will show you how, how we go about doing this. So I won't really go into proofs or anything, but I'll give you like all the major ideas so that you can kind of re re retrieve everything from there on. OK, so what is the key issue? The key issue was that uh, the, with constant probability, you are deviating away from the mean. So let's just go and fix it. So uh, to fix deviations below the mean, we'll start with a tighter linear program. So the previous linear program will add some more constraint to it so that it still remains an upper bound on the expected value of R. Uh, and we'll start with that linear program. And then to kind of fix deviations below the mean, we'll sample to diverse matching. I'll tell what diverse means in a bit. So we'll sample to diverse matching a priori, and then we'll use that as a guide in our online solution. So off, we'll solve some linear program offline, we'll sample to diverse matching from it, and then we'll use that as our guide in the online setting. And then because of the way you sample these two matchings, there's going to be uh, some inherent asymmetry between edges. So we'll handle them in a different manner. So somehow that will help help us get what we want. So some edges are going to be matched with much higher probability than others. So we'll kind of balance those things out. OK, so let's see what this tight end linear program is. So uh, what we had, what we saw was that the probability that a vertex never arrives was something like 1 over e. So the probability that a vertex arrives at least once is something like 1 minus 1 over e. So which means that the probability in an, that your uh, an edge can be matched has to be at most 1 minus 1 over e. So just add that constraint in. And the rest all remains the same. I mean, you still have the matching constraint. You still have the you have the constraint on the right-hand side. And you just add one extra uh, extra constraint for uh, making sure that you don't overestimate your probability. So in fact, you can kind of add many more such constraints. But to keep it simple, I'll just add one constraint. So you can, all, you can imagine that you could add a constraint at every u for every subset of vertices. For instance, uh, every, every pair of two edges the probability that they'll be matched is going to be the probability that, uh, like, one minus the probability that both their endpoints never arrive, for instance, which is, again, like some constant value. But I'll just add one, one constraint to keep it simple. Uh, but, like, to get the real 0 0.705 up till the third decimal place, you really need one more constraint. But so does this make sense? OK. Um, so once again, you can show that this linear program is an upper bound on the expected value of op. So you can rather deal with this linear program instead of op. OK, so what is this diverse matching business? So we want to solve the following problem. So if I give you a linear program vector x, whose dimension is uh, the number of edges, and your goal is to output two matchings, m1 and m2, such that the following properties hold. The first thing is that the probability that uh, any edge is included in any single matching should be respect the vector. So it should be xe. And you want to minimize the probability that an edge is uh, present in both the matchings. So it should be as small as possible. And that is the notion of diversity here. So these two matchings should look completely different in some sense. So if you somehow solve this problem, then the algorithm is going to be the following, that when a vertex V comes for the first time, just look at the neighbor in the first matching. And if it's available, match it. If the vertex is going to come for the second time, look at the neighbor in the second matching. And if it's available, match it. And if it comes third time onwards, do nothing, just drop it. So that, that's the notion of diversity we're going to uh, uh, like operate with. And this will make sure that if a vertex comes twice, they're kind of not like giving up the second time. So if you had just one matching offline, you would just kind of not know what to do after the second time onwards. 
So here, uh, this is a way to handle like, deviations above the mean. In some sense, if it comes once more, you can do something. And the reason you want it to be like uh, this probability that's uh, present in both matching to be small, it's kind of become clear in the next slide, uh, hopefully. So, and how do we solve this? It's not like that critical, but let me, one thing that is critical about this is the following, that what is the probability that it exists in both matchings should be small. And what is this value? This value is going to be something like 0.26. So we want it to be, uh, uh, so this is what we, we are able to get. And we use, uh, we use like a well-known dependent rounding scheme as a black box to do this. I mean, uh, the exact procedure is kind of like irrelevant. It's some black box you can feed in, you, uh, you can feed in an appropriate vector x, and that black box does something and gives you out two matchings. And uh, the two matchings have this probability that uh, the property that the edge is present in both matchings is at most point to six. Oh uh, no, they are correlated. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you mean by that? Uh, so, like, so, so, the you give an x, and then what it it kind of does is like when you mean how do you determine its correlation? Like, what exactly do you mean? Right. How do you, how do you find it? What is the best one? What is, is the best one? Or how do you so okay, so what what we end up doing is so you, so you randomly so you. Okay, let's say we randomly round. So we randomly get a vector x, which is which whose values are say between zero, one, and two. Okay, so let's let me look at joint distributions over that. So that so once I get joint, that will this scheme will give, tell me how to get the joint distribution over that, and from that I can get two matchings out of it. Uh, are there other questions? So this, it's not like critical how this black box works, but it's it, it's a kind of a, I mean, now it's a good good result. Okay, so what exactly do we mean by treating two edges differently, right? So let's look at, let's look at the pair of edges. Uh, so some edges are going to appear in both matchings, M1 and M2, and some other edges are going to appear only in one matching. So let's call all edges that appear in both matchings to be large in some sense, and a small otherwise. I mean, if it appears in only one of the two matchings, it's going to be small. Okay, so uh, let's say we have some target ratio A in mind. In our case, we'll kind of get 0.7. So uh, the co construction of the matching would imply that like the large edges don't get matched with high probability, or it will only get, say, matched with something slightly less than A. On the other hand, the small edges get matched with much higher probability than what you want it to get matched. I mean, like the the rational behind this is the following: that like, so since large edges are appearing in like both matchings, in some sense, like its its neighbors are getting blocked more often. In some sense, so the trick here now is to do the following: that since anyway these small edges are getting matched with much higher probability, it doesn't hurt to match them with slightly lesser probability, which will still be above A. But then what this would uh, imply is that these large edges don't get blocked too often. So in some sense, these uh, these large edges probability will now be approximately A, which is what you wanted, and now we're all happy. So this is kind of what is like broadly called attenuation. So like I'm kind of sweeping many details under the rug here. Like how do you determine what is the probability with which you have to drop and so on? But like this is a high level idea that like you kind of somehow uh, independently toss a coin and say, okay, I'm not going to match any small edge in this round, and uh, It'll appropriate, like we'll decide appropriately, like how to determine that value. Uh, but once somehow you can figure that out, then just to imply that these large edges start to get matched with much higher probability than what it's getting matched before. And uh, this will this will kind of balance out the performance of these edges, so to speak. Like, th does this high level idea make sense? Okay, so in fact, like this has been this kind of attenuation has been useful in like other to like other algorithms as well. Like here's a kind of a non-exhaustive list. So for uh, we are able to get some improved results for stochastic packing programs and other models of online matching. So uh, so are there any questions so far? So does the high level idea of how the algorithm works, is that clear? Like the key ideas in the algorithm? 
Okay, so now I'll talk about one specific extension uh, it's called reusable vertices. So what is this model here? So as before, we have an offline graph and you have some offline vertices and you have some online vertices which are being sampled from a distribution. And when a vertex comes, you want to match it to, a, uh, to an offline vertex. So what uh, additional feature here you have is that these offline vertices, after they're being matched, uh, they become unavailable, but then they can become available after a certain time. And that again is determined by another distribution. So you have another distribution over, uh, like an independent distribution from which these things are being sampled, which will tell me that after how many time steps will this vertex be available again? So now you can imagine you can kind of match some vertices more uh, because it will become available later. Like the simplest example could be that like every vertex comes uh, becomes available after k steps. So it's unavailable for k time steps, and then it comes back after k time steps for some k which is known. But in general, it could be some distribution over uh, like some distribution from which is known to the algorithm. Like, does this make sense? So I won't describe the algorithm. So it's kind of going to use ideas from the thing I described before. So what we get is we get a half competitive ratio. And uh, more importantly, we can uh, this also kind of models some like a naive version of a ride share application, which I'll talk about that right now. So this is from like with joint work with people. So uh, I won't talk about like how to get the half competitive ratio, but I'll talk about like like very briefly about what like how this model is right share. So in this one, the, the set of each frames like one thousand the set V? The, the oh so the V remains same as, as so before. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's only on U which can go off and come back in. So V the set V remains the same. Okay, so I will kind of like very briefly set, tell how this model is right share. Uh, this is like a very small uh, experiment, so it's not like in a large scale experiment. So we'll sample uh, 30. So we use this kind of standard data set called the New York taxi data set. Uh, so from which we'll sample about 30 cars at random. And uh, we'll use this to model the right share application. Uh, so what does a run of an algorithm mean? So how many time steps are there? So we'll take some two hour window in the in the day and then we'll fix that as our number of time steps and we'll try to do like a ride share matching within that two hours. And since this is in New York, so we New York conveniently can be split into grids. So we'll uh, use each grid as like a cell. And uh, so each vertex V or each what is a set V. So it's a pair of the starting cell and an ending cell. So if you take any pair of starting cell and ending cell, that totally determines the complete ride. And so that is the type of a vertex. And uh, we'll make this assumption that we'll only match it to vertices that are nearby in some notion of nearby. So maybe like 10 in Manhattan distance, 10 or something will we'll not match to drivers past that. And the edge weights are going to be just the price for this ride. So this data set tells, tells us what is the price of each of these rides that have been taken. And we'll use the price of this ride as the edge weights. And we'll evaluate our algorithm with kind of two commonly used algorithms. Like the most natural thing is the greedy algorithm, which is when a vertex comes, just take the highest weighted neighbor. Uh, and then like, I don't want to give much details in it, just to tell that, yeah, we are doing good. Otherwise, it wouldn't be on the slides here. So uh, we do uh, slightly better than what these uh, algorithms that don't have like a kind of theoretical guarantees. Uh, so, so that's that's about it. So, like, do you have questions? I mean, so this is just to say that, like, I mean, so for two things. So, first thing is, is this even practical to be implemented? So that is kind of. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello. Oh. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat what you just said? Hello. Oh, who are you talking to? Uh, to you. Who's you? Uh, Tom. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, Tom. Can I ask now, what, what, what benchmark problem this is um, you're doing? Is this simulated? Yeah, yeah. so we, sim we, sim we, sim we, uh, we simulate things from the data set. So we simulate all the requests from the data set. And uh, so all the, this entire testing is on the simulations. So what is the news from this new okay. timeshare? Yeah, just so you know, there's a little bit of lag between the YouTube and the, uh, and the Skype. So okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of uh, communication delay. But yeah, okay. uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, what so what do we use? Oh, so we use like what, 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 what these distributions, we learn the distributions from which. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the arrival distribution and, and, the, and the prices, okay. right. Okay, so I will uh, conclude this sec this part of the talk with some future direction. So, I mean, the probably the most obvious direction is to fill this gap. I mean, uh, in the weighted uh, setting, we have 0 0.705 as an upper bound and 0 0.823 as a lower bound, and there's kind of still some gap between these two, and you want to fill it. Like, I mean, it's unclear what the right answer is. And more specifically, you can like kind of think of uh, online matching in like three broad axes. So you can ask what your total reward should be. I mean, so here we only spoke mostly about linear functions, but it could be some submodular functions of your uh, edges. I mean, your edges could be some elements in a set, and it could be some submodular function of that. Or you could ask what kind of inputs you get at each time step. So here we assume that one side of the vertex comes online. But some you could you could have uh, settings where like both sides are coming online, or for instance here we assume like independence across time. It, the distribution need not be independent, so there may be some correlations across time step. So this is like another axis along which you can have like extensions, and the third axis is like how do these action sets change? Like do you want to maintain a matching or do you want to maintain something say something called a B matching, which is like you can match every vertex up to B times. And uh, you can also talk about this generalized assignment, which is that uh, you have multiple uh, resources and you have multiple budget for each of them, and you want to match a vertex to, uh, like you can match a vertex as long as all budgets are uh, fulfilled. And any combination of this is like kind of interesting. And I put some uh, representative works, which is a totally unbiased sample in the literature. So, so are there any questions uh, uh, like on this part of the talk? OK, so I will move on to the second part, which is bandits with knapsacks. So uh, uh, so this is going to be uh, like a slightly different model. And it's going to be a model of learning in some sense, which will become clear what it means. So what does bandits with knapsacks? So uh, this is a model where you have k arms. So you have uh, k, which is known, and you have k arms. And you have d resources. So there's some notion of resources, and you have d of them. And each of them comes with their own budget. So you have B1 to BD. Each of this uh, has uh, like a smaller than T. And you have T rounds of interaction. And with each round, you've chosen action A from AT from one of the K arms. So basically, you pull an arm AT. And you obtain a reward RT of AT. So you have some reward for the chosen arm. And you see consumption C1 to CD for each of these arms. So you have uh, D. Uh, so you have D resources for the arm. To, for the arm you pulled, you see D consumption values. And uh, if one of these, if you exceed one of these resources by more than its budget, you cannot play anymore. Or in other words, you'd only keep playing the null arm from then on. And your goal is to maximize the total reward. And uh, so we'll make some without loss of generality assumptions that like all budgets are same. And uh, you have uh, like I didn't really tell you how these RT and CT are coming from. So if they are coming from a distribution, we'll call them stochastic. If they're set by an adversary, we'll they'll call them adversarial. So is the setting clear? So it's let's see how this fits into the sequential division making framework. So what is the input you observe? So here at time step one, you don't observe any input. So your algorithm starts before the nature. And from time step greater than one, you see the reward and consumption of the arm you chose in the previous time step. So you see the reward and consumption of arm 80 minus 1. And your action set is going to be one of the k available arms up till you until you don't exhaust resources. After you exhaust resources, your action is going to be just an alarm. So uh, like until you don't exhaust any resources, your action set doesn't change. And immediately you have your action set changes such that you only have the null arm to be play with after that. 
and your uh, goal is to maximize the total reward. And so what do we do here? So in prior work, stochastic bandits with knapsacks is kind of well studied. Uh, like there are optimal algorithms with like extensions and so on. Uh, so this talk is primarily going to be about adversarial bandits with knapsacks. So uh, we are going to assume that things, the rewards and consumptions are set by an adversary. Uh, but then the way to get to that will be by giving a new algorithm to the stochastic version, which is why like the stochastic version is kind of important to keep in mind for the talk. So, so what is the main result? So the main result is, as I said, we give an uh, optimal algorithm for the adversarial bandits with knapsacks. Uh, and then the, the key technique is going to be via reduction. So we're going to reduce, uh, like we're going to solve this by using bandit algorithms as black box. Like bandits is a well studied field. So we, there are many, many algorithms there. We're going to use like many of that for free. And uh, th that would imply that we get many of these extensions for free as a result of this reduction. So let's again look at why is this problem hard? So. Uh, let me look view two. Let me look at two arms. We have arm one and arm two. So arm one consumes uh, one resource. Let's call it resource type X. Arm two consumes another resource. Let's call it resource type Y. And each of these has a budget T over two. So at each time step, uh, if you played only one arm at every time, like if you play the same arm at every time step, the best you can get is T over two. On the other hand, if you play a distribution between each two, you can get a reward of T in expectation because. Uh, you can you have two different resources and you'll kind of smoothly use these two resources across all time steps. And uh, this is kind of like why uh, this problem is hard because now you have to deal with distributions and not just with arms. And more importantly, like a common technique in this bandit kind of problem is to use exploration, meaning that you want to play other arms to figure out you're not missing out too much. But the problem here is every time you explore, you're going to consume resources. So you kind of can't explore too much. So we have like limitations on the number of samples you can collect. Yeah. So in, 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 in my business, when we talk about decided models, uh, there's some underlying maximum problem on the micro. Right. And as a distribution and an optimal distribution for the adversary, which often turns out to be a point one. Right. Uh, here it is slightly different from the right? And, and so here the optimal need not be a point one, for instance. Yeah, I think that's kind of what this example is also showing, right? So it's going to be a linear program again, an optimal solution to a linear program. Yeah. So we can't like give a closed form for the distribution, but it's going to be an optimal solution to some linear program. Okay. So what is the benchmark like? So the bench. So you can have multiple benchmarks. So you can either have a best fixed arm or a best fixed distribution, or a best dynamic policy. So we're going to only primarily deal with distribution. So if you, if you knew everything a priori, what is the best distribution you can optimize things over? And that is going to be our benchmark. And uh, so you already know what a ratio means. So I'll tell you what regret means. So if you can write down expected value of reward as some ratio times op minus some regret. Uh, so ratio is what you just saw so far. So regret is just the lower order term. So if the ratio happens to be 1, which will be the case in stochastic bandits and knapsacks. So then you want to find off, make sure that you, your lower order terms are also as optimal as possible. But in the adversarial setting, we'll still deal primarily with competitive ratio. And competitive ratio goes between 0 and 1. Regret goes between t and 0. So the lower the regret, the better. Higher the ratio, the better. OK, so let me show you a quick example which shows that you cannot get a ratio of a constant competitive ratio, and then uh, you can use the same construction to get like 1 over log t ratio. So uh, here's the example. So you have two instances which look identical up till the first half, and both of you give both of them give medium rewards. But in the second half, one, in one of the instances, one arm gives you a really low uh, reward, and the other arm gives you a really high reward. And you have only enough budget to play half the round. So if it was instance one, you should have used all the budget in the first half. But if it was instance two, you should have used all the budget in the second half. But you don't know which of these two instances you're dealing with until you played half the round. And kind of that's where you lose a factor of half and that leads to a ratio of like four over five. And doing the same thing uh, kind of in a more nuanced fashion, you can show that you cannot get a ratio better than one over log t. So in the adversarial bandits and knapsacks, our goal is to get the ratio of one over log t. And this is an example. I mean, uh, a version of this example is what shows that. 
Okay, so I'll start with uh, stochastic bandwidth with knapsacks. Look, so I would, I will, like the contribution here is like, it's a very simple analysis. Probably like each sub parts of this are things you would have either seen or would have seen in like a learning theory class. So uh, how does it look like? So as before, we'll use a linear program to upper bound opt. So this you have seen already once, this is gonna be the same thing again. And then with the linear program, there is a Lagrange game associated with it. So which is that there are Lagrange functions and optimal min max value of the Lagrange function is the optimal value of the LP. And then we are going to use this kind of a celebrated result that like you can, if you play two online learning algorithms against each other, they converge to the approximate Nash. And then just combining these three things together, we get our final result. So I mean like parts one, two, three are like kind of very standard things. And putting them together in this form just gives gives out the right result. And to put this in perspective, like all prior works on stochastic binary knapsacks are like far more involved, and like proofs are not like do not come out as easy as possible. So I will kind of skip over these things and I'll just directly go to the main algorithm. So the main algorithm is the following: so that so you have a game, so you have two game between two players. Let's call them algorithm one and algorithm two. So algorithm one chooses arms and algorithm two chooses resources. And then the payoff they're going to get is this Lagrange value of the linear program. So it's immaterial what this Lagrange function is, but it's some function of the primal and the du uh, or the distributions chosen by algorithm one and algorithm two. So that's going to be the payoff to algorithm one and cost to algorithm two. And uh, the critical Nash property is that if X and if the optimal uh, distribution X and optimal distribution lambda is a Nash, is a Nash equilibrium, then X is an optimal value to the LP. So this is the standard fact we're going to use. So based on this, we'll use the algorithm is as follows. So let me take two black box algorithms for bandits. So I'll call them uh, EXP3 and Hedge. I mean, they're well-known algorithms. You don't need to know what it is. So the algorithm goes as follows. At every time step, uh, EXP3 chooses one action, which is AT. Uh, Hedge chooses one resource, which is JT. And then you, you observe the outcome vector, which is the reward and consumption for the chosen action. And then the value you reveal to algorithm one and algorithm two is some appropriate function of these Lagrange values. And there is one uh, parameter T0 here. So we'll set that T0 to be T for the stochastic version. And in the adversarial setting, we'll just modify that T0 and we get our final algorithm. So this is like a standard repeated uh, learning in repeated game setting. So you just have a repeated game going on and two algorithms are playing against each other. And our main algorithm is exactly that. So does it make sense? Okay, so, and then what is the celebrated result we are using? We are using this fact that if you look at the average play of both these algorithms, they approximately converge to the Nash of the game. And this is like a well-known result by now. So uh, there's some subtleties here because our game is stochastic. These things work only on like deterministic algorithm, deterministic games. But I mean, it's kind of a folklore extension. After using the right concentration bounds, you get the exact, uh, you can retrieve the same theorem, even for stochastic games. Yeah, so it'll converge to the expected game. Yeah. And this is the regret bond you get. So you get regret, which is which scales appropriately, and it's optimal when, uh, in, in, in some special cases, it's optimal. It's not optimal in the truest sense of the term, in the sense which pri prior algorithms get. But the main contribution here is that we give a very, very simple algorithm for this to retrieve the same result. And not just that, so we're also going to get an algorithm for the adversarial setting with the same, uh, with, with almost the same setup. So the problem in the adversarial setting is that none of these things are going to work. So uh, the learning in games framework, et cetera, breaks. But we can still get something kind of magically out of it. And what we get is that there was this parameter T0 I spoke about. If you set that T0 to be an appropriate random variable, after that, you're going to get, like, if you run the same algorithm, you're going to get the right bounds. So uh, in particular, you're going to get ratio to be like D square log T. And so D is like kind of a constant. So you're, you're worrying about the dependence on T and that is uh, optimal. So are there questions? So I won't go into the proof sketch uh, and for now, but uh, do you have any questions so far? Or like, so does the, is the algorithm clear? Like, do you know what the algorithm is doing? Okay, and so there is one more uh, subtlety here. The subtlety here is that this works only against an oblivious adversary. 
So the adversary has to fix all their rewards and consumptions a priori. Like they cannot change it based on your actions. But you kind of want stronger results where these things uh, can change with an adaptive adversary, meaning the adversary can see all your actions until this time step and or the previous time step and then choose their reward and consumption. So we want like the most strongest possible form of results. So we are able to extend this to uh, to such a setting with like, getting the same ratio. So it's a very technical algorithm. Uh, so like I'll just uh, give like the main ideas of it. So the main thing is that we use the previous algorithm as a black box, but call it with multiple random uh, calls. So we kind of uh, fix this T0 with like multiple random variables and keep calling them again and again. And then in one run of the algorithm, somehow we get the right bound. And uh, the way to do this is kind of using like using data to write down your own LP or estimate the value of an LP. And uh, you, there are like some standard estimators called IPS estimators. So you, with the limited data you see, you kind of estimate the actual value of the LP with high probability, and then use that to get figure out what the right value of T0 should be. And the analysis again kind of uses like these uh, the analysis for the oblivious adversary as a black box, and with like of course much more technical uh, depth involved to it. But so this is a very high level idea. I won't go into the details since it's super technical. Uh, and the kind of the biggest uh, I don't know benefit of this framework is that you get many more extensions for free. I mean, so if you look at it, each of these each of these extension was a new research paper by itself. So we're going to get all of that for like I mean, in, as a one line corollary of the main result. So in particular, we're going to get uh, contextual bandage, semi bandage, convex optimization, all of that for free. So you can kind of do bandit convex optimization with like resource constraints. So the only caveat is that the, when I say you need an algorithm for bandits framework, that bandits algorithm has to be a high probability algorithm against an adaptive adversary. These are not easy to come by. So which is why there are only three extensions and not 20 extensions, for instance, because the other 17 extensions don't have algorithms with that probability. So some future directions are like the kind of the ideal thing to get is this so-called best of both worlds, which is uh, the algorithm need not know, shouldn't know a priori whether you are in an IID setting or an adversarial setting, but you have to kind of uh, like get the right bounds. I mean, you run the same algorithm in both these settings. If it is a stochastic setting, you need to get the bounds of stochastic algorithms. If it's an adversarial setting, you have to get the bound of the adversarial setting. And these are not like too ambitious. These are known without knapsacks. So you kind of want to get it with knapsacks. And I mean, you want to also remove this uh, dependence on D in the ratio. So there's a D square term, if you notice. I brush it off by saying it's a constant, but what if there are, if it is not a constant? So then you kind of want to do better. So are there any questions on this part of the this segment of the talk? I'm going to kind of conclude in the next few minutes. So. So bandit convex optimization is the following setting. So at every time step, you pick a point. So there's a known convex set. At every point, you pick up. At every step, you pick a point in that convex set. Then you get a reward and a consumption. So the reward is a new convex function, ft, and a, a new set of constraints, say g1 to gt1 to gtd. And each of these are convex functions. And you want to maximize the sum of uh, these convex functions value at the point you chose. And you compare it against the best point in hindsight. So if you knew all these functions a priori, yeah. Another question is, once through this formulation, you have to be able to Right. Now, if you start with the problem, there is a setting. Is there some kind of a convex, uh, sorry, convex result that says that you cannot get an award more than this without going through the LP frame? Uh, yeah, I mean, so in the sense, you're right. So in the sense, these lower bounds should not depend on the linear program. So these lower bounds don't depend on the linear program. They depend on the optimal value. They're with respect to the optimal value. So I mean, like th that's not too hard because like these linear programs are actually not too far from the optimal. So like I mean, their their kind of deviation is all in the right in terms, the right measure. No, no, we prove that theorem. Also, the matching setting is both both subordinate rewards. So right. What happens in band? So suppose you have a subordinate function of all the actions taken. Is there anything wrong? Yeah, I think there is known without some things are known without knapsacks, if I am correct, right? Like some like some Kleinberg and others have some. Yeah. Suppose in band, it's just standard band, it's 
it's sort of the sum of the rewards of all the actions. Suppose you have a subordinate function of all the actions taken. Uh, that's some one, right? Subset or range, which is So something, but it's So are there any questions? Uh, if not, I'll just conclude. So we, sp I spoke about uh, online matching and bandits with knapsacks. And both of these are in this framework of kind of doing sequential decisions with like limited resource. There's one other thing which I really wanted to fit it into the talk, but I just realized it would be too long, which is about doing uh, something which is a very related problem called causal learning, where you want to learn causal effects between variables, but you're getting like samples kind of sequentially. And again, you have limited samples. So you're, you're bound by the amount of samples you're getting from an experiment. And then with such samples, you want to ask, like, when can you do causal learning and like how and so on. So in like a recent couple of recent works, we kind of answered this for like various regimes in like a specific model of causal inference. Uh, if you're interested, I can talk about this later. Uh, so I'll stop here and like, thank everybody in particular committee, co-authors, and so on. So like I like this quote which says that you cannot study an ant colony by just studying an ant, which says that like a lot of these things come by our interactions and not by a single ant, so to speak. I mean, so much of the research is due to like a lot of interactions with many people. Uh, thankful to all of them. I'm thankful to the funding. Uh, and of course, I'm also thankful to these institutions, uh, UMD, of course, which like housed me for the last five years. And of course, I also want to thank like Microsoft and ISC where some of these research happened. So I'll stop here. Thanks.